Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is a special recording from the 235th birthday celebration for David Crockett. Scott Williams, president and CEO, talks with Broadway entertainer Bart Chateau and University of Tennessee at Martin professor Dr. Art Hunt. For some reason, this script crossed my desk and I read it and I called him up immediately in Austin and I said, I would really love to work with you on this script and I'd love to play Davy. And he said, let's do it. And so we retooled the script. It was about 40 pages long and it was just literally just vignettes and stories about that, you know, Davy's in a, in, a, in a bar in Memphis several days before he heads out to tennis to, to uh, Texas. It takes place in 1835. And uh, that's where our show takes place. And uh, several days before he makes that big move. And he's this in a tavern with some friends talking about his life um, over a bit of the creature, he calls it, the drink. Um, and I thought, this is fantastic. And so we, we beefed up a lot of themes like bullying because Davey was bullied as a child and, and uh, you know, uh, fled school and, and um, things like that as well. We beefed up him and Polly and his relationship as well. We uh, workshopped the show in New York uh, about three, four months later, and this was about two years ago, and uh, at the Dramatist Guild, and we got a producer, and they loved the show, and we got a publicist from that, and then we decided to retool it again, and then do it again in New York at the Cell Theater in Chelsea, and um, then they booked a, um, a performance for it at the theater in St. In St. Josephine Theater in Austin, um, uh, San Antonio, Texas. So, and we did a performance, a couple of performances down there, and then COVID hit. And um, Steve also passed away this past January. So, um, Steve said to me, Bart, I want you to get this story out there, whatever you have to do. And uh, it's been a, <laughs> a labor of love for, for me. Um, and to come here and actually premiere the show here um, in a mini version of the show. And we actually just workshopped the show two weeks ago in New York at the Irish Rep. Uh, with a Broadway team, so the big guys, and and they all have a stake in the show, and they brought a bunch of indigenous music to the show, and and it just really amped up the quality of the show, and uh, so we are excited. Um, we're going to be looking out to theaters around the country, and um, to see if they're interested in in booking the show. But I think it has a mainstream appeal, and Davy is such an idio idiosyncratic character, and uh, love playing him, and I'm I'm. It's my mission in life to get this story out there. So I am very proud to be here with the fine folks of Tennessee and to perform this for you. So thank, thank you. you. And I still have stage makeup on, <laughs> as you can see. <laughs> so um, Art, how about you? How did you get inspired to uh, start uh, presenting David Crockett? Well, I grew up in Tennessee. Uh, and one reason that uh, I came back after being and a few other states teaching college was my father was ill and we wanted to get back for his sake. Well, my father had a, a historical fiction on Crockett and uh, when I would visit, I would just take that off his shelf and, and read it. And I said, Dad, can I take this book home? Uh, this is really good, I'm really enjoying this. So he said, yeah. So I took it home and finished it. And of course, growing up in Tennessee, I knew about Crockett, but I didn't know the details of his life. Now I have some theater background and my son also is a theater major at, from UTM. And um, they asked my son to come at it, to, to go to a, a, a venue at a, uh, an elementary school and do Columbus for Columbus Day. And so, he dressed up and went, and they paid him for it. And I thought, this is, that's really nice uh, that they would do that for you. I thought, what would happen if, if Crockett started showing up at school? So what would that be like? Uh, and so I started researching. I read Crockett's autobiography. I read about three biographies on Crockett. And after sort of internalizing uh, the material, it was very easy to write a script. I actually write, wrote uh, a one-man show, uh, and I'll sell it to you. Uh, uh, <laughs> First, you First you have to I, see I, me perform I, the role. I, I'm sure you, I can't wait to see yours. <laughs> but you know, Crockett has a voice. And, um, 
And that voice just wanted to get out. And so I put it on paper, uh, I, and I would go to state parks uh, between my lectures, and I would walk around with this script. I would stop in the middle of the woods and practice. And uh, it, it took me about three months to get the, 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 the monologue up, and I created a program called uh, uh, The Story of Davy Crockett t as Told by Himself. A lot of the material comes directly from his autobiography, but a lot of it is infused with material from other biographies. So the program that I did for three years for elementary schools and state parks, uh, as well as other venues, uh, was about uh, 45 minutes long, a 30-minute monologue, as if Crockett was uh, about ready to go over uh, to Texas. Mm -hmm. Uh, so he, he could, you know, so he we stole your idea. I, I, well, yeah, he, he could have given this speech in a Memphis bar. He could have given this speech on the lawn of the courthouse in Jackson, Tennessee. He could have given this speech in Bolivar. But it's that, it's that uh, final speech, uh, and he did give speeches before he went over uh, to Texas. Uh, it's that speech, and, and so that's the speech that I give. Uh, it's the story of his life, and so uh, had a, a lot of fun doing it. And just this past week, someone contacted me and wanted me to do Crockett, and I had to tell them I'm not doing it right now. And so I'm thinking maybe I should get that coonskin hat out. I don't know. <laughs> I think you should. I think you should. So, Bart, what um, did you do to prepare uh, to be Davy Crockett? I read a lot. I read a lot of his books uh, that Steve sent to me from Austin, and um, just a lot of documentaries. There's not that many documentaries about Davey, um, but it was just the source material, um, uh, well, the, Lion, the Lion of the West, or that, I, that's, I just poured through that because it's so very, very specific, and you really get a sense to, to see the very interesting character that he is, very quirky character that he is through his book. And also, I read Scott's book, which oh, is incredibly you. detailed. I didn't even pay him to say that. Incredibly so, researched, incredibly detailed. So that was, that, you know, so, so just reading and also just using your imagination. And also, um, my friend Steve, late, late friend Steve Austin was a, was a aficionado of Davy Crockett. He knew everything about Davy. So, and it's all written, uh, not all, but a lot of it's written in the script. Um, so, uh, you know, sometimes it's on the page, and um, but I'm a big researcher. I'm a big history buff, I, especially during the Civil War period, and I love just digging into every book about about Davy. But I do recommend Scott's book as well. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, as you're you're uh, performing as Davy Crockett in the areas where people probably don't know much about him, what um, are you finding as you perform him? around the country that people are surprised by? Well, we've only performed it in New York, so which I thought was a very odd place to do it because it's New York, and they're very snooty there. And, uh, and Davey talks about the Easterners, and um, even though in his autobiography he talks about taking a trip to New York and how much he loved the people there. Um, and I thought, well, this show is just not edgy enough. It's too homespun for New York. And so I, I still think it's not, doesn't have, like the creators, the creators uh, that have joined the team, our Broadway director, Nick Corley, said, oh, Bart, it's never going to do off-Broadway. It's never, never going to be on Broadway. I'm like, why? Um, I said, I'm going to go out to the hinterlands, to the fine people of Tennessee and Texas, and see how well we do, and see if I get a thumbs up from them. And they will come back to New York, because I would love for it to have an off-Broadway venue. It's a small show. It's easy to produce. It's four musicians and I. And, um, and so, yeah, and getting back to that whole th thing as far as researching the role, I also hired a dialect coach uh, for the uh, regional uh, Eastern Tennessee accent. I even had Scott read through the entire script and send it to me as he recorded it um, to, 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 to get that very specific dialect. Uh, I'm from Illinois. I have a Midwestern accent, but um, you know, Davies, Davies dialect was very specific and um, very unique. So I don't know if I'm succeeding with it. Dialects are difficult, but um, we'll see if you guys see the show. And I've been working hard on the dialect as well. So that was a huge part of my 
um, research for it as well. So how about you? You're performing mostly for uh, folks who've probably been exposed at least to the words Davy Crockett. Um, what are you finding surprises people or, or uh, what, what is the response? I try to hide myself you know, when I was doing this from, from everybody. Uh, if I was at a school, say, I wouldn't let the kids see me at all. Uh, and then they would introduce me and I'd come walking in with the buckskin and the coonskin cap and the long rifle and the Bowie knife. I don't know if he had, he had a knife. I don't know if it was a Bowie knife. I found the Bowie knife. I sort of had to go to antique shops and, and gather material and I ordered some things. But I had a very nice uh, buckskin frock. So I was able to assemble the clothing that I think uh, was approximate to what uh, Crockett would wear. And so, you know, when I walked in, in front of a classroom, just to see the eyes of those children uh, light up, uh, it was, it gave me great pleasure. And so they would ask questions afterward. And, and, and I prepared for questions, questions like, well, you know, what, what was your father's name or what was your, your first wife's name? They didn't ask me questions like that. They would ask me questions like, uh, what do you feed your horse? And what's your horse's name? And, and so you just had to roll with it, you know. But I get the greatest pleasure is just not just with school children, but with other audiences, just the, the energy that Crockett puts out, and then they give back to you. It's, it's magical. And Scott, I'm sorry, I, I sort of didn't really answer your question, but our last incarnation of the Irish Rep in New York, the, the audience wanted to hear less about the politics, and they wanted to hear more about Polly, and his second wife, Elizabeth. And so we fleshed those characters out a little bit more. So they wanted more about his love life and his personal life. Um, and, and also less of a, David Lutkin, our musical director, calls it a hagiography. Hey I guess a portrait of a guy without showing the warts and all. So we are really trying to peel back the layers of the onion and really present to you a three-dimensional three human being. You know, and not, not some mythological guy. So, and I think people want to see more of just that layered guy who who's, has faults. And maybe sometimes a little self-aggrandizing, maybe some, sometimes a little arrogant, a little stubborn. So, you know, uh, audience, New York audiences wanted to see more of that in the show. So you've experienced um, a measure of fame in your career, which you've done a lot of really cool things. Um, you could probably relate in some ways to David Crockett uh, launching a career and become famous before famous was really even a thing in America. So do you have any thoughts on, on to what do you attribute his becoming famous, um, which was really what started me writing that book. Um, you know, how did somebody go from being a nobody to becoming famous. You should answer that. You wrote the book about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you read it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's quizzing me now. <laughs> uh, well, I think it was, it was beginning at the Whig Party that were very anti-Jacksonian uh, that, that, that kind of built up Davy's celebrity and then sent him on this book tour and then, I guess, encouraged him to, to recite his stories and they wrote it down and then that's when he, and he actually became even more of a legend even after he died. So, uh, but you know, I mean, are these the, when I tell people this guy went on a book tour, they're like, he went on a tour back in the 1800s? So he was like a rock star. I mean, he's actually speaking to five, throngs of like 5,000 people. I can't even imagine that. And there's that story about him getting stage fright and that, that young boy about his age saying, you know, you can do it, Davey, and he overcomes his nerves. And I want to put that in the show, too. It's a really cool moment in the show. But, yeah, so, um, yeah, how did, what was it a tribute to? In, in, in our story, it's like, you know, I didn't want fame. He said it's mostly luck. He said I come from common people. He, he said, as common as coon crap in a barley patch. He said, my parents were so poor that their dogs had to lean up a tree, lean up against a tree just to, just to bark. So 
Um, it's funnier in the show, by the way. Um, <laughs> when I'm Davey, I have a perfect timing. When I'm Bart, not so much. Um, and so, yeah, so, so he was just a common, he, he said, I'm just a common guy, a common feller like all of you guys. And um, I think he was very surprised and kind of tickled by his celebrity and kind of liked, like anybody else, like a, a regular human being, you all, we all love applause. You know, you don't have to be an actor to like applause. Everybody likes that, that recognition and validation. And Davey was no different. So Art, um, you can probably enlighten us a little bit on uh, Crockett and Tennessee and, and his relationship with the folks back home. Uh, speak a little bit about that. Yeah, let me bounce off of uh, that question that you gave him. Uh, I think uh, Crockett began to get just a little bit of a understanding of fame when they asked him in Lawrenceburg uh, to, uh, to kill wolves. Uh, so they were paying him uh, to, to go out and kill wolves, and they were being, he was being paid by the scout. Uh, and he, later on, he became a judge. Now, he didn't know very much about that sort of thing. He was pretty much illiterate. I mean, here's a guy in Middle Tennessee, and uh, they're asking him to, to be a judge. Uh, I know in his autobiography, he says, I didn't know anything about the judiciary, much less know Latin. Uh, so it, there was, um, he was uneducated, he was illiterate, but yet he was a judge. And it was, it was very, um, it wasn't very long after that that he uh, ran for his first office uh, in, the, in the state of Tennessee where they had the capital in Murfreesboro. But I think that's where he first got the bite uh, of fame is when he had some prominence in Lawrenceburg. Um, uh, of course, he, af after Polly died, he married into wealth. He was able to have a meal and he um, became a leader there in Middle Tennessee and then was elected to state office. Uh, but I think that's where it began. And then, and then um, after he went to Washington, of course, he continued to, to represent uh, the poor people um, of the region. Yeah, he became more sophisticated, I think. But he already, by the time he got to Washington, you know, it was coming in on the coattails of Andrew Jackson and that democratic uh, Western spirit, and we're going to come in and we're going to take over <laughs> uh, Washington. And um, so, you know, he was coming in off of that. So here's Crockett stomping around uh, the state capitol. Uh, and it was, you know, in, in the Easterners, John Quincy Adams and others, uh, they were sort of taken back at it. So there were some people who were, uh, did not like the, the coarseness of Crockett. And some papers would uh, write very nasty things about him. Uh, some of them were made up. I don't know if this was made up or not, but the idea of going to a party uh, at John Quincy Adams and drinking out of the, the finger bowl and, and the, the waiter coming over and getting his plate after he finishes eating, and he, and he says, don't, don't take my plate. Uh, well, you're stealing my plate, and that sort of thing. And so he, he got a reputation for, for being coarse, but the, the, the people coming in to um, you know, the, 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 the nation, the new states like Tennessee and, and, and so forth, they, that's what they liked. It's not that different. I mean, there's some parallels between then and even now with the populism uh, that we see in our own politics. So uh, you guys are not the very first uh, to uh, represent Crockett on stage. Um, there's a, a number of uh, people through the years. Carl, we're going to go to the next uh, slide. One, mo one more. One more. There you go. So this guy right here is Jim Jeffries. This is in November of 1904, and he was a boxing champion. 
and he did a Crockett show on tour. Um, and the advertisement for it says that there is a boxing exhibition to follow. So he combined two of his passions. Okay, the next one. This is Alan Sears, and this is him in the 1915 Martyrs of the Alamo, which was a silent film. And so at, when I wrote my book, I wanted to put a lot of photos of people representing uh, Crockett uh, through the years, through the ages. And so I think my favorite one is this next one, uh, which is Peter Tork in an episode of The Monkees called Hillbilly Honeymoon. His uh, character was named Uncle Raccoon in this episode. Um, and then we've got this guy right here. Uh, so this is Bart, um, dressed as David Crockett. And... The way that we connected to begin with is I saw, I, I just Googled, I was trying to find contemporary people representing David Crockett on stage. And so I Googled and I ran across his photo and I just looked him up on Facebook and sent him a Facebook message and told him what I was doing and what I needed and could I use his picture. And he said, absolutely, tell me more about Discovery Park and what you guys are doing there. And so he actually uh, came and visited a few months ago as part of his uh, research and that's how we connected. Um, and so you can go to the next one. And there you go, and there's Art in his uh, full regalia as he's educating. Um, obviously, education is a really big part of our mission here at Discovery Park of America. And so I'm curious, as an educator, um, what is the difference between doing a lecture or um, you know, presenting information like this? Well, we were talking about this uh, just a few moments ago after a very nice uh, talk uh, that we had before coming in here. And we were talking about history teachers. I'm not a history teacher. I teach young people how to stand up and give speeches. That's what they pay me for. But I think the best history teachers that I've had are not people who make us just memorize dates, but these are people who can tell stories. So I, I think going into a classroom and telling stories... My Crockett uh, presentation was a string of stories, and I think probably Bart uh, does the same thing. You go from one uh, little uh, episodic story to another, boom, 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 and you tie them all together. And uh, we, as human beings, are storytellers, and we like to hear stories. I mean, this is old, this is old as the hills. This goes all the way back to the Odyssey and the Iliad. Uh, so to go in and tell a story uh, and to make it come alive, make it real. You know, so many of us now are on our cell phones, but what we really like is embodiment because we're made that way. We have bodies. And so for, you know, for the student after a, after a presentation to come up and, and touch you, to touch your buckskin, or can I touch your gun? <laughs> uh, that's learning too. Uh, it's not just reading about it. And I'm, I don't mean to diminish reading, but when it comes to history, I think to flesh it out, make it flesh and blood, I think it can be very, very powerful. I'm going to ask a few more questions, then I'm going to let you all ask questions. So be thinking of something that we've got, we've got two David Crockett, we've got three David Crockett's here in the room today. So uh, be thinking of a question that you might like to ask one of these gentlemen. Um, what's, um, Bart, what is something that you hope that you leave with people when they leave uh, your show? Oh, boy. Um, a great appreciation of our history a great appreciation of the people that made our, that, that made these states what they are, that made the great state of Tennessee. And as Davey says, you know, the hardy sons of the soil, the men who entered this country in cane when it lay thick in, when it lay thick in cane and the, from the mingling the sweat of their brow with the fruit, the, the labors of their hands, the people that really built up this country to have appreciation. I think right now we are so cancel culture these days. We can't, we're canceling everything out. We're canceling our own history. And you know, our history, our American history, has a shadowy past that's not, that's, that's somewhat I don't want to say it's not, it's shameful, but we have to look at it and say, this was our past. We made mistakes. We were greedy. 
we killed, we did things we shouldn't have done for power, for greed, for ambition. And we have to face those. And, but, you know, we're taking down statues. Um, and I don't know what we're doing with those statues, but, you know, it's, it's a part of our history. And it, we're, we're not perfect human beings. We all have histories we're not proud of. But we all have to be accountable for, for what we've done and move forward with a, with a better future, you know, and a more peaceful future in which we're treating others with love and kindness. And, um, and so I, I'm hoping that they, they come away with knowing Davy a, a, a little bit more and seeing the human side of Davy, but also, you know, Davy really stuck up for what he believed in. His value system was paramount to everything in which, you know, Jackson destroyed his political career because he voted against this Indian bill and, and uh, it, Davey wanted this thing passed. He wanted a land bill passed. And so he really stuck to his guns to make this happen. And they tried to smear his name. And so I'm, I'm hoping that people also, you know, f through the example of, of this show, that they, they're like, you know what? I, I want to stick more to my guns. I want to have a strong value system like Davey. When I, I want to walk the walk and talk the talk. And so I'm hoping that those elements, those inc incredible characteristics, very noble characteristics that Davy has will come across the stage and people will take those with them and hopefully live their lives with, with that. And same question for you, Art. What, what, okay, let's, sorry. I'm, I'm not an entertainment professional, so I stepped on your lines there, so sorry about that. Um, how about you? I was hoping you would ask me uh, who was the better Crockett, John Wayne or Billy Bob Thornton. I was waiting for that question. <laughs> uh, and I forgot the question that the, uh, you were... The question was, uh, what do you hope you leave students with in the classroom when you leave? And it's Billy Bob Thornton. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think what I would want to leave my students with would be, uh, I can't wait to go to the library and check out a book about Crockett and read about him. If I can inspire a student to do that, I think I've done my job. And, and that correlates very well with the mission of Discovery Park of America, which is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. So Emily has uh, the microphone. Um, are there any questions for these guys? This is a great opportunity to ask the burning question you've always wanted to know about David Crockett. Back there, Emily. I asked her if she would be the, the Phil Donahue. I'm not exactly sure she knew what that meant, but <laughs> she said yes. This one's for Art. Who's the better, John, who's the better David Crockett, John Wayne, or Billy Bob Thornton? This Borden? is the question <laughs> I've been waiting for. No, in prep. In, prepar in preparation for this panel, I actually watched John Wayne and Billy Bob Thornton uh, over the last couple of weeks. And I want to say <laughs> that they're both great movies. So if you have not seen The Alamo with John Wayne, made in 1960, uh, John Wayne actually directed that. He also produced it, and he starred in it. The that means he really had a passion for this movie. In fact, he left his studio uh, that he had worked with uh, for so many years to do this film. And it's a great film. It's a, it's a beautiful film. Uh, but I must say that when you watch it, uh, this is John Wayne as Crockett. I mean, and, and John Wayne, you know, if you look at his movies... Uh, John Wayne uh, is almost pretty much the same, and I think uh, the director Ford kind of uh, gave him a, a persona that John uh, really kept through a lot of his movies, and so when you see John Wayne as Crockett, it's kind of like John Wayne in The Searchers. Um, however, Billy Bob Thornton, uh, who I understand is also a, a, a Crockettologist, really got into the role. And it's very sad that they spent uh, uh, over 
uh, I think $107 million for this movie made in 2004, and only grossed like $29 million, which is, which is sad because it's really a good film. It's more historically true to the facts than the 1960s Alamo. And in fact, Scott and I were talking about this uh, several weeks ago. You know, I think Billy Bob Thornton nails it uh, with Crockett pretty well. <clears throat> and you might watch it and say, well, this is, this is not the wild man that I expected. But by the time Crockett gets 50 years of age, he's mellowed a little bit. Um, and so I, I, th I think Thornton portrays that pretty well. Uh, and it's just a great movie. So I would encourage you to watch the Wayne movie, watch the Thornton movie. You decide. But uh, I, I really like uh, Thornton's portrayal. I, I'm curious to know what, what Bart would think about that. Um. <laughs> <laughs> How many other versions did I see? I saw almost every. He likes movie. Peter Tork in The Monkees. Peter Tork. I, I thought he was great. I love that film. Yeah, I thought he was great. It's very interesting you say he does mellow out, but that's not going to be happening in my show, Art. Uh, he's, pretty, he's pretty energetic. Um, but he has moments where, you know, in my show, it's, it's, you, you really, I think, I think you see, you get to really see, you know, because he's, he's beaten down by Jackson. He's beaten down by losing Polly and, you know, and, um, and, you, and in the, the real show, like the full-length show, that we're only showing half the show. You really get to see him. Uh, he's 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 worn out. He's he's worn out from politics, from everything. So um, in this particular show, you'll see at three o'clock, <laughs> he's bouncing off the walls. But you know he has to recount his. He talks about his childhood and meeting Polly. So he's kind of going from story to story and using. But but that's that's also a great acting note too. It's like Bart, just calm down, just. You know, think about Davey was just so self-assured and so confident, you know, and he commanded a room. You knew that Davey was there, and you can tell also by his voice. They talk about how his voice was, he had this very thick accent, and you could hear him across the room. <laughs> so we're trying to portray that in Little Chapel there as well, too, uh, that he's bigger than life. And it is interesting when you research a lot of people who encountered him in real life before he was really Davy Crockett wrote of his intense charisma and how much he could command a room and how much people just instantly fell in love with him, which is, you know, a lot of the reason why he won so many elections. So is there any other questions in the audience right back here? How was he as a father and did any of his children follow in his footsteps in any form of fashion? That's a great question. Uh, well, let's start with his first wife, Polly, uh, sort of a, I wouldn't call a high school sweetheart because he didn't go to high school, but uh, that was his really true love, and I'm not sure exactly how many children they had. They had several children. Three. Three. Uh, yeah. And then uh, she died, and it was a great loss for him. Uh, he moved to Middle Tennessee, and he married uh, Elizabeth Patton. She had more wealth, um, but that marriage was a little bit different. It was it, some people have even compared it to a business arrangement. Um, it was actually a foot up for Crockett. Now, whether or not they were happy in marriage, I don't know. Here's the thing about Crockett: he had an itchy foot. And after a flood destroyed his mill in Middle Tennessee, he was ready to go off somewhere else. Of course, he was always going off once he became a state legislature. He would go off. He would go off bear hunting, stay gone days. Uh, and so uh, Elizabeth had to deal with that. Uh, but when he, was, when he crossed the Mississippi to go to Texas, he was looking for a place to settle, uh, settle down. Um, some people say that Crockett and Elizabeth were somewhat estranged by that time. I'm not so sure how estranged they were. Uh, but he was gone a lot. Uh, yet, at the same time, I wouldn't call him a bad father. Uh, 
he would take his children. For example, I believe uh, on a lot of his hunting expeditions, he would he would take some of uh, not just his children but relatives. I think when he went to Texas, he t took his his son-in-law and his uh, nephew uh, when he went over to Texas. So he, I would call him a family man for sure, but he had the itchy foot. And then his son did follow in his footsteps um, after he died in Texas. Um, to, to, to draw us to a close, um, what, what impact do you think the way that he died, and I'm going to ask each one of you to, to answer this, what impact do you think the way that he died um, had on what eventually became the myth of Davy Crockett and, and his longevity of his uh, name in history? Um, if you didn't go to the Sam Houston talk, uh, I think this plays into that. Why do we talk about Crockett and why don't we talk about Sam Houston as much? You have to remember that before the Alamo, Crockett had already risen in prominence. He was being considered as a presidential candidate to be ran against Van Buren. That's how popular he was. Uh, but he was thrown out of office um, primarily because of his Indian removal bill. And um, so when Jackson, uh, you know, and, and then he had the tension with Jackson. Um, but as far as his legacy, uh, you can't talk about Crockett without also talking about the, the birth of, of Texas. Because if it wasn't for the Alamo, I don't think there would have been the motivation in Texas uh, to support uh, Sam Houston. So, um, and then we just identify with Crockett. He's an iconic figure, as Bart said. He was a rock star uh, for his age. And then Bart, how about you? What do you think Texas, uh, what role did that have on his longevity of his name? Well, my friend Tom Center, who wrote the music for the show, lives in San Antonio, from San Antonio, and he was just telling me that there are a couple guys who wrote this book that the Alamo never happened, or detractors of the Alamo, or that the people um, were fighting um, at the Alamo for... Um, the peculiar institution of, 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 of slavery. Now, uh, I don't know if that's true, but I'm not sure, I'm, I'm sure that not everyone was fighting for the, um, during the Alamo for that particular reason. And Davy was, uh, was not that person. You know, uh, Davy was, t when he says in the show, when I, in when I go to Texas, I intend to, to take the oath of allegiance to the provisional government, and I shall say nothing derogatory about that government since it's merely provisional. So he got tired of politics in Washington. He got tired of the bull, and he was looking for something new. I mean, he's like um, Art said, he was an itinerant guy. He had that itchy foot. And... Um, and he was, he was looking for something new, especially when, when it came to governing and leadership. And he, he wanted it to match what his dream um, uh, politics was, and whatever that may have been at the time. And um, I, I think it's a shame that this book is coming out about the Alamo, because I, I think that's a very slanted way. And also, there were, there were Mexicans that fought in the Alamo on the opposite side what were they fighting for? It's just like the Civil War. Everybody was fighting for something different. And they gave up their lives for, a, for a, something important to that particular individual. But because Davy died with a, such a gruesome death alongside Jim Bowie and, and Travis, it mytholo mytholo mythologized with him, that's a word, and this, the, the way he died was a hero's death. And there's so many stories, and that's what the show says. There's just so many stories that go, are going around about how you know, how he died, and there's all these crazy stories that he survived, and they, you know, and they found Davy in some sort of like a um, a mine where he was working in Mexico, or something. You know, it's crazy, like conspiracy <laughs> theory stories, and um, and so it's just like, yeah, he 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 died a hero's death. He died for fighting for what he wanted for Texas to be his ideal Texas. 
and it wasn't necessarily for that peculiar institution. Um, and so um, I think that's what's made him so, so famous um, as far as the way that he died and what he was fighting for. So last question, and I'll ask each of you, do you believe that the uh, David or Davy Crockett name will endure long into the future? Well, you know these rumors about David uh, surviving the Alamo. Fast Parker, he, he picked up the idea. He wanted to revitalize his role uh, as Crockett and said, you know, the idea that Crockett is still, you know, it's like Elvis. Yeah. I saw Elvis the other day at the yeah. gas station. You did. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I think Crockett is going to live on uh, for a long, uh, long time. And I am so happy, number one, that the Discovery Park uh, allows us to have a uh, memory of that. And I'm so happy that Bart is going to uh, do something with Crockett, is doing something with Crockett, not just in New York, but maybe uh, his show will have a, a national uh, audience as well. And Bart, how about you? You think Crockett's going to be I hope to God so. <laughs> <laughs> for the sake of my career. Uh, I've, I'm rolling the dice on this one, guys. You, sir, you have a question there. Sorry, Scott. If Crockett's life in Tennessee was the truth, and and he became a myth in Texas. Um, he was used iconically uh, to prevail in in a, a geopolitical war and to rally people. But honestly, I Almost had like a hard that. time identifying what would take place here in West Tennessee. When you called him David Crockett, I asked myself, who is David Crockett? Why are you renaming him when he was always Davy Crockett? And, and uh, at the time, Davy was kind of a pejorative. It was an insult. He always went by David Crockett. And so when we're exploring um, that aspect of him, then uh, we, I called him David Crockett in the book and of West Tennessee. When I posted, I got all kinds of uh, grief on social media from people in East Tennessee who said David Crockett, Davy Crockett is from East Tennessee. And so, you know, but my book is exploring David Crockett, the guy who ran around Real Foot Lake, the guy who settled here and represented our people. Um, but that's a great question. Thank you. And uh, getting back to his, uh, the endure, like enduring his fame and for years to come, I'm hoping that this show, which is a musical, so if you, if you ask who's the best singing Davy Crockett, I hope you say Bart Chateau. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be the only singing Davy Crockett you'll ever see, uh, unless I get an understudy. Maybe Scott can be the yeah, understudy. Yeah, there you go. Um, Art but, can do that for you. <laughs> yeah, Art, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm hoping that this show will endure not only with the with the with the story and the way it's told and the music. And the music's incredible, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I, he has a universal appeal, and 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 you know, and getting all the bones out of Steve's Steve's script of like the whole theme of bullying. He was bullied by he said an older scholar, who uh, you know made fun of him in front of everyone because he couldn't put letters to words, and and he left school. He literally fled school and never went back because he was. He was demoralized by this kid. So I'm like, bullying is such a huge issue these days. It's always been. We've all been bullied, but it's really bad with social media. I'm like, we need to bring this up more into the story. So, I mean, I wanted to bring these universal themes, and I think he's, he's more relevant than he, is now, than, than he was back then because of his celebrity and his, his, his self-made celebrity. Everybody's trying to be a celebrity through TikTok and have that 15 minutes of fame. And, um, and you know, Davey was so, like, no exception, even though he really didn't, you know, yearn for it or search for it. But, um, yeah, that idea of celebrity, what Scott really s celebrates in this book and really goes down that rabbit hole is a very interesting thing. And um, Davey was no exception, even back in the 1800s. So I'm hoping that that is relevant to today's time as well. And just also as celebrities, as people, 
you know, we look at Hollywood celebrities, we go, oh my gosh, they're, but you know, you know th- then we see them picking up their dog's poop and they're like, well, that's a regular person. <laughs> you know, and I, like demythologizing, whatever that word is, about Davey it is, is, is also kind of a universal appeal in our story as well, which I'm hoping that people are like really attracted to. That, you know, this is a real human being who had fears and, and um, loss. Thanks to all of you listeners who have joined us today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com.